All right, enjoyed hearing you sing this morning. Uh, children, if you want to make your way to Children's Church, now's the time to do that. And the rest of you, I would invite you to grab your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. <clears throat> Well, we are in the midst of looking at this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to this young pastor named Timothy who was pastoring the church at Ephesus. And what had happened in this church is the leadership got really messed up. And because the leadership got messed up, then the church was not functioning the way God wanted them to function. And so we're right now in a section in chapter 3. We just finished up talking about the right kind of leaderships in in regards to pastors, to bishops, elders. All those three words mean the same thing. And now Paul is switching to this office that is called the deacons, the deacons. And what we're going to discover here is there are two official offices in the church Elders, pastors, overseers, if you will, bishops, and deacons or servants. Uh, We see this in Philippians uh, chapter 1 where it says this, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops or pastors and deacons. And so this morning, Lord willing, we're going to see two of the four things in your outline Um, And they are this, we're going to look at this, kind of answer four questions like what is the relationship between deacons and pastors? What does that look like in the church? What are the requirements to serve as a deacon? And then next week we will be talking about the reference to the deacon's wife. If you don't know, that's a big controversy. If you like controversy, make sure you're here next week. Okay, just a little thing we're going to figure out. Is that talking about deaconesses? Or is it talking about deacons' wives? So there you go, okay? Are you, is your whistle wet there a little bit? Okay, well, not. Come back anyway. And then next week we will look at the results of a deacon who serves well. So we're here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Hope everybody's found it there. And as we've kind of set up a custom here at church, uh, when we read corporately together, we ask you to stand in reverence to God's word. So if you'd stand with me and follow along as we read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. It says this, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those also first be tested. Let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband, husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word. God, I pray if there's something that we're studying this morning that we're not really doing accurately in the church, that you would help us to embrace that. And God, that you would also, if the things that we are doing well in our church, that we'd be encouraged with that. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to see this tremendous uh, office called deacon. We ask this now, Jesus, in your name, amen. You may be seated. I'm sorry, but my phone is talking to me, and I can't shut it off. Don't tempt me. I have no idea what that is, but it's going to keep playing, so it's muted. (laughs) Here comes the tech guy. All right. <clears throat> tech guy to the rescue. I just turned it down, Frank. So I thought maybe it was Pandora playing at me, but I don't know. All right. Here we are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. 
And we're looking then at this office of deacon. Now, I think there's been a lot of confusion in the church about the role of deacon in relationship to the role of pastor, elder, bishop. <clears throat> For example, there are some who view, the, they view it from a status perspective. So they say, well, like pastors are up here, and then the deacons are like one step here, and then the church body is down here. That's kind of how some people view these office relationships. Others view them to be like a checks and balance kind of thing. Well, you got the pastor over here and the deacon board, man, they got to hold this guy accountable. And so we have this checks and balance system. And then we have also those who view the deacons then, they're like my personal representative. I pick them so that they can go and represent me to the pastors and, and the elders kind of a thing. And so they're like my personal representative. And, and we get those last two things because we live in America. Okay, that's just, that's just how we do it in America, right? We pick representatives to go and represent us in the government kind of a thing. And we also have different representatives who hold the president in checks and balances kind of a thing. And so my question is, is any of those views accurate though? Is that the role of a deacon to hold the pastor checks and balance for the pastor to be your personal representative and, and, and are they in a two-tier system kind of a thing? Are those biblically accurate? Well, that's my goal today. Let's see if we can't break this down and, and help you understand this office a little bit. First of all, the word deacon is a transliteration of a Greek word, diakonos. You say, what does that mean? Well, there are times in the scriptures where there's not a meaning for the word and so they just say okay here's the greek it looks kind of like the word deacon so we just make it deacon in english is kind of how we do that um, then there's other times like king james who did not believe in um, immersion they back when they were writing the bible in the king james or in the english version they believed in sprinkling so instead of writing the word baptizo which is in the greek they transliterated it to baptism instead of actually the word means to be immersed. And so we can't talk about the Bible being telling people to be immersed, so we better make it just baptism instead of immersed translation. Well, in here, I think what we see is the church is moving forward. And the Greek word literally means servant. Most of the time, in fact, there's only, I think, four times, three times when it's translated transliterated as the word deacon and they did that to represent an office that's the reason they did that so the first thing i want you to understand when we're talking about deacons it is an office in the church and the basic meaning is servant a servant so it, when we're talking about then a relationship here the first thing that i want you to understand they have different functions in the church that's the idea. They have different functions. Now, we looked a lot at the terms overseer or bishop, which means to oversee. We looked at the word um, elder, carries the idea of ruling, a senior person who rules. And we looked at the word shepherd or pastor, which means to care, or a shepherd. And so we got from that a kind of an overview of what the role of a pastor is. Well, the word deacon, because we get from that word, it means to be a servant. So what we see then in this function, this relationship, that deacons provide the serving elements that emerge from the pastor's oversight in the church. So let me just put it up here. This might help you a little bit. From the words we said, a pastor's role is oversight, care, instruction, and leading, whereas the deacon's role is that of service, of service. Now, it's important to understand this twofold dimension because God is giving two different functions for two offices in the church. And we see the foreshadowing of this in, in the very founding of the church. And I want you to see this. Turn, if you would, back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6. If you're a new to our church and, and you uh, want to see this in the Bible, maybe you're a new Christian, it's, it's page 765 in the black pew bible and it's page 1687 in the large print blue but turn if you would to acts chapter 6 
Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want to see this is a foreshadowing. This isn't the office of the deacon and pastors being set up here, but it does foreshadow the two dimensions of offices in the church. Notice, if you will, in verse 1, it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, so the church is growing. It's growing at big numbers because it's multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. The Hellenists were Greek um, converts, if you will. Hebrews, they were, they were mixed Hebrews and, and, and Greeks. And so there's this conflict that arises between the Jews and these half-Jews, if you will, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the multitudes of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should be, leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. They're full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, here we see that the early church is starting to grow big. And this, this problem arises in the church. And it's like, okay, if the pastors are going to take, deal with this problem of this daily distribution, because remember, widows and orphans, um, the, the church took care of them, and they would distribute money to them, distribute food to them, that kind of a thing. And so these, the, the apostles say, look, we've got to give our attention to the word and to prayer. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so you guys pick seven godly men, and then we will appoint them over this business of serving tables. That's the idea. So from the early days of the church, we see this need of a two-dimensional positions or offices in the church. We don't know, the scripture doesn't tell us the exact time when this office was created, but we know by the time 30 years after this passage here, we come to Timothy and we see that, God, uh, that Paul is telling Timothy, here's the requirements for a deacon. So we know sometime in that 30-year that period, this office arose. But the goal of this office was to take off of the overseers, the shepherds, the pastors, these practical daily things of serving the body of Christ for them. That's what we see. And so that brings us then to a second characteristic between the deacons and the pastors, and that is this. They are designed to complement each other. They're not designed for you to be up here and them to be down here. They are complementing each other. They have a complementary ministry, if you will. I believe there's a lot of confusion in the churches because of how these two offices are viewed. Uh, typically, we, as I said earlier, they are seen through the lens of status here and here. That's not biblically accurate. It's, they, they should be seen as different roles of function. That's how they should be seen. So a lot of times it's either, as I said earlier, uh, the pastor's up here and deacons are down here. And that then gives the idea one is inferior and the other one is superior to them. That's not God's intention. Because, as I said, we're Americans. We see these roles as this group is supposed to be holding this group accountable, checks and balances. But... When these views, when these two offices are viewed, viewed through the lens of service, one is serving the body through instructing them. The other one is serving the body, trying to take over whatever this, the, the elders say, do this to help us out. Then when you see it that way, you see it, it's, a, it's not status, it's function, it's roles. Uh, let me try to illustrate this for you. Um, you know, from previous sermons... The husband and wife relationship in, a, in an American culture is just, it's not seen biblically correct. Because in our culture, it's like every, you know, we, you got men's chauvinism. It's like, by golly, I'm the head of this home. You do what I say. And if not, here comes the hammer. And then you have the woman who says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. You don't have any rule to do that. And so if, if you, uh, if, you know, the old saying, if I'm not happy, you ain't going to be happy, you know, kind of a thing takes over. And we see this sometimes this banging. And yet, we know this. True or false, God sees men and women as equal status. 
true, right? There's neither male nor female in Christianity. But, true or false, God gives men a distinct different role than he gives women. True, right? So, that's why the woman is called, in, back in Genesis, the helpmeet to the husband. So, women, if this makes you feel better, that just means we need a lot of help, okay? So, there you go, okay? We need help. I'll be the first to admit that, okay? So, the wife is not inferior to her husband, but she willingly takes the position under him as the head of the home. The man is not superior, but he is given a different function to lead his wife the way Christ leads the church. And Christ leads the church through loving servanthood. The same way when you think of pastors and deacons within the church and how they relate to one another, the pastors are giving the function of headship or oversight or ruling, if you will, and the deacons are given the role of service, carrying out whatever tasks are assigned to them by the elders or that is needed by the congregation. Their role is service, okay? That's the idea. Now, some might object and say, well, you know, well, pastor, if that's true, you're getting all the authority in the church because you're the pastor here. And that means if the deacons aren't holding you accountable, you can do whatever you want. Well, I understand that. I can see that. Uh, if there's only one pastor, who's going to hold that guy accountable? Um, uh, and I think that is a good question, a good two questions, really. Which How much be that you should set in order the things that are lacking and do this, appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And even James, who's writing to a bunch of the, the church that's just been persecuted and under all kinds of suffering and stuff like that. He says this in James 5.14. Is anyone among you weak? Anyone among you just sick, spiritually sick, spiritually weak? Let him call for the, again, plurality, elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So here's where, to, to any questions that you might be thinking about, well, if you give all this power to one guy, what if he just screws it up? And who's going to hold him in accountability? The answer is you have a plurality of elders to hold each other accountable, just the same like with deacons. And so just maybe, I'm just throwing this out, maybe it's time for Twin City to think about having an elder board. Just throwing that out to you, just to think about that, where it's made up of both paid pastors and lay pastors, but both whether they're paid or laid, lay, they have to fulfill the requirements in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Just a thought, just throwing that out there for you. Don't you like the way I just throw those out? And, okay, now let's move on now. So turn back to 1 Timothy 3. Now, just like the pastors are to model spiritual vir virtue, okay? Remember, all those characteristics we looked at pastors all dealt with his integrity, his spiritual virtue, except for one, and that is he has to be able to teach. Just like that was true for pastors, deacons are also supposed to be models of spiritual virtue in their role as servant. Uh, this is why there are really no second-class status. That Just like what he expects out of pastors, he expects out of deacons. And by the way, do you know why he wants models before the congregations that are the same? Because that's the expectation for the church. In other words, I'm going to put models up here because our ultimate goal is to bring glory to God. And so the pastors and the deacons have to model this stuff so that the congregation will say, yes, this is how we should be living. We should all be striving to, to, to live for the glory of God. So we come to these things about these characteristics of virtue. So what are the requirements then to be a deacon? What are the requirements well, <clears throat> they're pretty much identical, as I said, to that of pastor. So let me give you eight characteristics in this verse. I'll put them up here, too, to help you to see this. The first characters, I'm going to give you all in S's because I've already covered this once, so I'm just trying to come up with a new way to try to keep your attention. That might not be working, but and if you want to write a different word in there, go right ahead. All right, first of all, a deacon must be serious-minded. 
Notice it says, likewise, deacons must be reverent. That is a Greek word that means they should, have, they should see things with gravity. It's a vital thing. It's to be important. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, I love this, it says it like this, quote, deacons are serious men of dignity, not clowns. It's just like that. I mean, that's just, they're dignified, not clowns. That's the idea. That doesn't mean that they can't have fun and laugh. I'm not saying that. A deacon must, though, not be silly. He must not be a flippant person who makes light of serious matters. And by the way, anyone who serves in the church with this responsibility, anything that you're doing in the church, it should be done with a serious mindset because God has given each of us spiritual gifts to serve the body of Christ. You say, well, what about cleaning the toilets? Glad you asked. That was my first job in ministry was to be a custodian at a church. And, you know, I don't know about you. I do not like to go to public bathrooms. I hate that. I hate to go in there and thinking, man, I wonder who sat on that stool or, you know, that kind of a thing. And, oh, I got to touch this and wash my hands. And then how do I shut them off, you know, without the germs? And listen, when I was a custodian, I made it my ambition to make those bathrooms as clean as possible they could be. I made sure the carpets were swept. I made sure anything that I did, I tried to do it with excellence because that is God's desire, is that whatever we do, we do it what? Heartily as unto him. There's no second-class status in, in preaching versus somebody who comes and cleans the pews. It's all the same. It's all the same. And, and that should make sense. There should be, if there's no menial tasks in the church, that means all tasks are spiritual tasks. And we should see it that way. So a deacon must be serious. He cannot be flippant about different things. Secondly, deacons are to be sincere. <clears throat> they are to be this sincere. Now, you see this in the New King James Version. It says they're not double-tongued. That's really a very good Tra uh, uh, translation of this what it means is a deacon does not tell different stories it's not dealing with gossip it's he's not telling the same story now again the idea is a deacon is not to say one thing to this group of people so that they will like what he has to say and then come over here and tell another story to a different group of people so that they feel better about themselves that's when, when we're going to make a decision with this act of service, the deacon is going to say the same thing to whoever he talks to on that. You want to divide a church, you do that. You tell this group what they want to hear, and you tell that group what, what they want to hear. And eventually this group's going to say, wait a minute, that's not what he said to me. And you're going to divide a church by doing that. A deacon's speech must be characterized by integrity, consistency, and honesty. A man who tells two different stories to two different people will quickly lose their confidence, and in all reality, he's going to manifest, whether he realizes it or not, a manipulative motive. Because I want these people to like me, and I want these people to like me. And all that is is manipulation. That's all that is. And so deacons <clears throat> must be people who are serious in their conduct. They are sincere in their speech, letting their yes be yes and their no be no. Thirdly, he must be sober. He must be sober. Now, here we see he's not given to much wine. Now, that phrase is different than the two phrases we saw back in, in verse uh, number 3, where it says a bishop must be temperate which means he, he, he is completely void of wine. And then it also says in verse, so that's in, at the end, beginning of verse 2, and then in verse 3, not given to wine. So these, this word here, this phrase is a little bit different for deacons. And what it means literally is <clears throat> that, that he is one who, it means one who is near to, wants to be near to, to be brought near, to be attached to, to have one mind think about. It's, it's different, okay? It's different. So deacons 
the way I can see this, deacons are not to be preoccupied with drinking. They don't want their mind brought near to it. They don't want to come near to it. They, just, they don't want to be preoccupied with that. And, and I think the best solution for any kind of wine... Um, by the way, I had a man give me a, a book on that, and, just, and he just said, Pastor, why do you think people want to support an industry that really does no good for America. You know, you think about that. How many people have been killed because of drunk driving? How many women have been assaulted and beaten because of drinking? Why do we want to give money to that? I just thought that was a great question, a great application. And, and so, anyway, here, here's, the, here's the solution to that, Okay. I think the Bible says don't be drunk with wine because if you do that, that's dissipation. All that is is self-indulgence is what that word means. But rather be filled with this. Be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, when we were back in Acts 6, remember what kind of men he said to choose? He said, choose men who are full of the Spirit and wisdom to oversee this business. So again, I think that uh, the best way we can say this is they're to be sober they're to be sober. Fourthly, deacons are to be satisfied. If you don't like this word, the, you can put the word content in there. But again, notice it says they are not greedy for money. Now, they are men who, street, who, who are straight in their financial dealings. There's just straight shooters in that. Deacons in the early church would routinely be given money to go and to take care of, like I said, widows, orphans, people in need. And so you have a great opportunity if you're a man who's greedy for money. Uh, let's see, do we know anybody about Easter time who was greedy for money? Oh, yeah, Judas, right? Judas loved to take money out of the, uh, out of the money bag because he was, loved money. And he says the, the deacons in the early church, they had a huge responsibility in serving the widows and the orphans and those in need and provide funds for them. Remember in the early church that they were going out and they were selling their land. A lot of the Jews were selling their land and they were bringing it in and laying it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed to people who were in need because the church was just booming when they all came in at Pentecost and, and all of a sudden they hear this gospel and they just people are getting saved and, and, and it's growing into the thousands. And how do we take care of all these people? Because they didn't want to go back home. They wanted to stay there. And they were selling in their property and bringing it and laying it at the feet so that it could be distributed to the people. So a deacon cannot be a person who is just infatuated with money. Um, they just cannot be that. Um, Paul will again talk about that in chapter 6 in this letter. Uh, and he's going to tell us that the love of money, not, not having money. There's nothing wrong with having money. Uh, you know, I think everybody in here would love to have some more money. But it's the love of money versus the love of God that causes all kinds of evil. <clears throat> and, he go, and he's going to tell us back in that section that the solution to that is contentment. Be content with what you have. Godliness with contentment is great gain, he's going to tell us. And so that's where I get this idea of satisfied. They have to be satisfied. They can't be tempted to steal. I just wonder how many churches have lost so much money over the years from fraud, from just, you know, just because they had a guy in charge of the money who loved money more than they loved God. Fifthly, deacons are to be doctrinally sound. Doctrinally sound. There we go. There we go. They are to be sound in doctrine. Notice again in verse 9 now, he goes on and he says, they hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Now, what is that talking about? Well, <clears throat> In a nutshell, deacons must know and hold to the scriptures or obey them. The word mystery means it's something that was previously hidden but now has been revealed. So what was previously hidden? What is the mystery? Well, it tells us uh, right up here it is the mystery 
of the faith. In other words, what happened is in the Old Testament, they didn't understand totally what was going to, what, about Christ. And we don't know that until Christ comes along and he reveals the mystery of the gospel. In other words, you can't work your way to salvation. You can only give your life to Christ because of what he did for you. There's nothing you can do that's good enough for you to merit salvation. The Old Testament was all about trying to work and work, and they give them this animal sacrifice and, and show them, look, you, you know, there's got to be shedding of the blood to pay for your sins and all this stuff. And, and yet, in reality, they, had, they didn't really understand this mystery of, of Christ. They didn't understand that God was going to come to this earth and be incarnated, become human flesh, so that he could walk perfectly on this earth and fulfill the law, so that he could take our sin upon himself. The wages of sin is death, which means separation from God in, in eternity in a lake of fire. And so Christ lived a perfect life so that he could take our wage, go to the cross, and die and be buried, but be raised again on the third day, proving that God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And for those who put their faith in Christ, turning from them being the boss of their life, turning to Jesus being their master, God makes this tremendous reality come true. He takes his perfection, and he credits it to our account. And he takes our sin and credits it to his account, his death. He paid, he substituted for us on that cross, giving us his righteousness and him taking our sin. And so it's a tremendous blessing that you understand, but the, they didn't understand that. They didn't get that. But we get it today. And so he's saying here that deacons must know and obey the scriptures. They've got to hold to it. They've got to hold to this mystery of the faith. They've got to hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've got to hold to that. So deacons then must understand Christian doctrine. They've got to, how can you hold to something you don't know? That means they've got to be students of the word. They just have to be. Oh, you could put that one in there. He is a student of the word. There you go. If you like that one better. They must obey it with a pure conscience. What does that mean? In other words, as they're going through life, their conscience, the job of the conscience is either to accuse or to excuse. If they're living a life of accusation, their conscience just keeps saying, you say you're supposed to do this and you're not doing this. And, and you know the Bible says that. And they're living this life of where the, the, the conscience just continues to accuse them. He says, no, we want, you, we want men who understand the scripture, who hold fast to it, and their conscience is good. They're saying, keep doing what you're doing. It's excusing, not accusing them in that sense. That is the idea. So when we think of selecting deacons in the church, we shouldn't think of picking then men who are simply good at climbing ladders and painting walls. Okay, that's not the qualification because if that's the qualification, then what we're really saying is it doesn't matter if they have any spiritual depth to them or not. Okay, now we're talking about an official office. That doesn't mean that people can't come and help paint. Okay, we need help. We need painters to help. But we're talking about picking somebody for the office of servant. And that's the idea. To do that, you're in a sense saying spiritual qualifications don't matter for a deacon. And Paul just says that's crazy. That's crazy. Listen to how Warren Wiersbe puts this. He says, it's not enough for deacons to sit in meetings and decide how to, quote, run the church. Deacons must base their decisions on the word of God, and they must back up their decision with godly lives. A deacon who does not know the word of God cannot manage the affairs of the church of God. And a deacon who does not live the word of God but has a defiled or unpure conscience cannot manage the church of God. So just like there are no menial tasks, there's no menial deacons, okay? There's spiritual deacons, just like there's spiritual tasks. The way the church does everything, folks, the way we do everything will convey the very bedrock of our existence. What is the bedrock of our existence to know Christ and to make him known. 
That's the bedrock. And where do we get that foundation from? We get it from the Word of God. We get it from the Word of God. You see, a deacon, just like a pastor, has to understand whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it for what? The glory of God. The glory of God. Sixthly, we're almost done here. Deacons are to be selected. Deacons are to be selected. Now, <clears throat> where do you see that at? Well, in verse number 10, likewise deacons must be, and then it, we, we're in that phrase, let these also be first tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. So here we see this idea of first be tested. What does that mean? Literally in the Greek, in which the English is translated from, the word literally means to be approved after testing. That's what it means. So we don't just randomly pick men, but we watch men and we see, is their moral character matching up? Do they tend to love to serve people? That's the idea of testing. We approve them after testing so we are to study their life and so that you can realize that they are just like a pastor found blameless. There's no handles to grab hold of that guy and jerk him down either. That's the idea. So we observe them, and once we find them blameless, we say, hey, it's time for you to be a deacon. You've got the qualifications. You can do this kind of a thing. And so again, we see this, that you test them. And by the way, just just cuz just so you see that but let these also first be tested. So why is he saying also? Let these also. What's that referring to? It's referring back to pastors and elders. In other words, elders are tested and proved and to be found blameless and let these also be found blameless is the idea there too. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand this because i don't know if i've ever made this clear either with the pastors or now but this this phrase is in the present tense which means the evaluation is always ongoing in other words you're always evaluating me am i still living a life for jesus christ are they alive are they showing spiritual virtue so this is not a lifelong appointment this can be revoked, if you will, based on this ongoing testing. So I just wanted to throw that out. I don't think I made that clear in the deacons or the pastors. All right, la, uh, seventh, a deacon must be sexually pure. He must be sexually pure. Now, again, we're, we're skipping over verse 12 because I, I want to make sure, no, yeah, we're skipping over verse 11 because we're going to tackle that next week. So I'm looking at verse 12. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Now, again, this is the same thing we saw with pastors. This is not dealing with a, a person who is not married. This, that, that doesn't mean he can only have one wife. So if he dies and gets remarried, ah, he's disqualified. If he never gets married, he has not had one wife. So he's disqualified. Um, and under special circumstances, if he's been divorced, he's disqualified if he gets remarried. There, there's, this is, that's not what this is talking about. It's a terrible translation. But really, literally what it means is what it meant when we looked at the pastors. It means he's a one-woman kind of man. That's what it means. He is a one-woman man. In other words, he thinks about, he desires, he loves... One woman, and guess what that one woman would be? His wife, okay? That's what it means. So he must be sexually pure in his conduct with her and in his mind who he desires with her. It's the same thing as we talked about. Deacons must be models of sexual purity, they got to have one woman that they love with all their heart, mind, soul, strength. That's really what we go to God for, but you get the picture on that. They must be sexually pure. And lastly, he is a wise steward of his home. 
a wise steward of his home. Notice he's ruling their children and their house as well. We saw that with a pastor, and they said this and that one. How can he, if he can't rule his house, how is he going to rule his home? And so here we see he has to be a good steward of that as well. Deacons, just like elders, must prove their spiritual character in the home. If it's not happening in the home, why would you think they're going to do that in the church? They are to be good managers, good rulers of their children by bringing them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. So you look for a man and you say, hey, that guy has done everything he can to bring his kids up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. It means that. He manages his family well. Likewise, pastors also have to manage their relationship with their wife well. And again, we've talked about that with a pastor or with, under the pastors. He has to be able to, when, when he sees her struggling with a sin, he comes and he manages that and he takes the washing and uses the word of God to help and, and to wash her. He loves her like he loves his own body. He, what's that mean? He nourishes his wife. He cherishes his wife. We don't want some deacon who can't stand his wife. That's not the biblical model. That's a terrible model that is a ungodly model men are to love their wives like christ loves us and let's be honest christ loves us deeply likewise pastors they are like just like pastors they also have to be good managers of everything in their house it's not just their children but it's their homes as well and so again we talked about that they they have to be good managers of their money they're not chinging the credit card not paying debt and and have creditors calling after them they manage the possessions well they they you know when the roof gets a leak in it they fix it because they know there's going to be a lot of damage that's going to happen if you got a leaky roof. They manage their possessions, their money, anything associated with their own households well. Why? Because if they're not going to manage that stuff at home, we don't want them to be ruling and managing here in the church. So, those are the requirements of a deacon who serves. And as I said... That just makes so much sense. If, if you got any kind of common sense, that makes common sense to us. Because the Lord always sets leaders based on where their heart is, right? Remember we looked at David last week. I think it was David. I can't remember where I gave you the quote where Samuel's picking the next leader of Israel. And he finally, God finally tells Samuel, quit looking at the outside. That's what got Israel in the mess in the first place because they picked a king named Saul who was handsome and good-looking and just tall in stature, and it's like, by golly, that's the king. And Jesus says, no, stop looking at that with David's kids. I'm going after somebody who has my heart. And how do we know if somebody has God's heart? If you love me, you will keep his commandments kind of a thing. So that makes total sense that, that God always sets up leaders based on spiritual virtue because he wants people who, are, who ha, he has their heart. His concern, and this is totally different than America, his concern is not about talents and abilities, but spiritual integrity and virtue. And so the models, whether pastors or deacons, are to be examples of godly character. Why? So that we can model it for you and to encourage you that, hey, if, if this little dude from Grant County, Indiana, can live for Christ, so can you. Because it's not me doing it, it's Christ working through me. And that's the idea. Now, because Christ's desire is for the church to all live godly lives, this is all applicable to everybody in here this morning. This is the qualifications, this is the character traits that God desires for you to have as well as deacons and as well as me. I close this morning with a little bit of humor. I want you guys, when you leave this morning, to tell Bob Barnacue what an awesome deacon he is. Because he's the only deacon here today. <laughs> I tell you, 
They're all on board when you're preaching against the pastor of Ebbacolli when you're talking to me. <laughs> We're out <of> here. <laughs> I, I say that obviously in, in, in jest. Um, two of them are on vacation. The third one is home in bed sick this morning. And the fourth one is uh, uh, visiting another, his wife's husband, his wife's father's birthday is today. And so they're there. And they're going out together for dinner. But... Still tell Bob Barnacle, Barnacle what an awesome guy he is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are good and you are gracious to us. And Lord, when we talk about qualifications, um, sometimes they, those can be daunting. And yet, as a common person who's just given his life to Christ, when we understand that when we study your word and strive to hold to that word, you change us from one level of glory to the next. We don't do that. You do that in us and, and through Jesus Christ who lives in us. And so, God, I pray that you would be with each person here today. Help them to realize that these spiritual qualifications are attainable for them, not just for the office of deacon or the office of pastor, but for them. And, God, I pray that our church would just grow tremendously in loving you, desiring to be more like you so that, God, ultimately we give the right opinion of who you are. So I thank you for the qualifications. I thank you the heartbeat behind them and, and the desire to um, manifest just simple things like having a godly marriage before the world uh, around us. God, that's just a simple way that gives testimony of your love for us and the church's love for you. And so I pray, God, just help us um, this week as we go out that you would bring to our remembrance some of these things that we've seen. I pray, God, that you would help our congregation to continue to pray for our deacons that we do have, that they would continue to be students of the word, that they would continue to hold fast to the word, and, Lord, that they wouldn't be discouraged, God, and that they would just continue to just to be faithful. It's in your name we pray. Amen.